Ryan Flukowski, torpedo men seaman. I enlisted in uh, May of 1968 in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, I proceeded to the Great Lakes for uh, boot camp. I had always been brought up in a very tight-knit, close family, and I was very outgoing. My family was involved in politics, and so I was always, always uh, involved in sports. So camaraderie was not a difficult thing for me. My only problem was that I was very small. When I joined the military, when I graduated from high school, I was a little over five foot tall. As a matter of fact, I was the mascot for the football team in my freshman year because I was four foot seven. Um, so adapting to military life, because I was a clown, was difficult at first because uh, authority was a difficult thing for me to understand or to take. But after a while, I, I adapted well. My one problem, as I had said, mentioned, I was, uh, we had uh, the leader of the, our squad was uh, rather rambunctious with his sword. He used to swat everybody on the butt. And I had become friends with, uh, before joining the military, I started doing a lot of uh, karate. And I had learned how to use a stick very well. So when he came after me with his sword, I swirled the sword and hit him in the side of the shoulder. At which point he went and reported me and I got to stand with a gun for about six hours. <laughs> So discipline taught me well, quickly. After that, I went to uh, Key West, Florida for torpedo men training. They break down of actually what the torpedo did, how it worked, and at one point, um, it, there wasn't much to learn. You put the thing in the tube, and you learned how much pressure to put in there and fire it. After that, I went up to sub school for a while, but I did not make it because I can't swim worth a damn. Um, so they treated, so I went, was uh, transferred onto a destroyer, the USS Charles Sperry, DD-697 out of Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I was on that ship for about six months. We were going down to Gitmo on a uh, Gitmo mission, and they, our boilers got salted, so we got hauled back to Boston. I decommissioned the, the Charles Sperry in Boston and then was uh, assigned to the Lloyd Thomas in uh, 1969. Uh, in 1969, we got transferred over to uh, Pearl Harbor. We went through the Panama Canal. I remember going through the Panama Canal took quite a while. And then uh, because of the urgency that they wanted us over in Vietnam rather than traveling down south and going over the equator so you can become a shellback, they decided to head straight over. Because I think we arrived maybe a month before in Pearl before we uh, went over on our first trip. Pearl Harbor, well, being from Connecticut my whole life, you're not, you know, it's a different, different climate entirely. Um, it was, it was good. It was good. Matter of fact, after I got out of the military, I went back. I came to Connecticut for a couple months and I went back to, to Hawaii for six or seven years. I stayed over there. Uh, I got my wife, uh, I got married over in Hawaii on my, when I was stationed there. And then uh, my wife's father was uh, retired army and they were living there. So she said, right, and we had a child. So we moved back there for seven years until it was time for my daughter to go to school. and. Pearl Harbor, you, you know, when you pulled in every time you'd see the memorial and it was, it was disheartening or invigorating, whichever way you want to feel about it, that these men did exactly what was called for them to do. People, I'm, I'm at a loss for things nowadays because there's not the enthusiasm for our government that that was here. You know, a lot of the guys, I realized that when I was in the military, they were drafted, but there were also a lot of us that joined because of we appreciate what our country has done for us. So it was very little to give back to support what we felt was the proper thing to do. Um, 
I'm scared about the, the uh, condition of the United States right now and how the children are seeing what our country is. Uh, well, in sleeping quarters, there's an, an alleyway that's probably two feet underneath is uh, stainless steel racks. Well, they're not racks. The, uh, where you store all your gear, lockers, I guess you could call them. And then the beds are, well, ours had three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen all together. There was three, three, four rows of, four rows of three, three high. Um, and then behind, uh, up above us was, I, gosh, I don't even remember. I think we were underneath the, the uh, mess hall, and then everything was flat after that except for the gun room. Most of the time I was in the gun mounts or at the, on the torpedo deck, and I, well, it was AS Division, Anti-Submarine Division that I was in. We also went in there. That was a very tight-knit group. There were, that's the thing about destroyers. Um, everybody knows everybody, but Everybody that's in each division is a very, very tight-knit group. You know everybody, but you're not familiar with everybody. The food was okay, you know. You get used to everything. They ran out of milk. I worked in the mess hall for a little while. Every Well, almost everybody works in the mess hall for a little while. But the food was good. You know, you get overseas and things, you know, you get used to the food, that's all. <laughs> yeah, everybody had a job and, and when you're out to sea, you stuck to your job. That's what you had to do. That was what it was. In September of uh, 1970, we made our first trip to Vietnam. Um, on 9-11-1970, I was uh, going in the front gun mount when the gun mount exploded, killing the gentleman that I was supposed to uh, replace. Uh, we went to Kikuska, Japan and had a new gun mount put on and went back online. Uh, after we finished our three months there, we went back to Pearl Harbor. I was uh, in the forward gun mount, I was a hot shellman, which when, uh, when the gun fires, the shell gets ejected. You take that one, put it out, and then the gentleman standing next to you, which was the loader, would the, the uh, the shells would come up, they're injected up to the top, you'd take another round and put it in. Um, depending on how many rounds you're firing and what you were firing, because uh, at, at times in the evenings we're using um, uh, uh, star shells a lot um, to uh, light up where, well at, the, at our first trip it was Australian troops that we were supporting. Um, and then the, the so that my job was to, uh, I, it was usually three or four hours, depending on, we'd fire three, five, 15 round sh salvos, be both guns or one gun shooting, depending on what they needed on the mainland. I have uh, tinnitus really, really bad. Uh, from Pearl Harbor, uh, we went up to Alaska for patrolling the waters for the uh, atomic blast that we had up in Alaska in, I believe it was 1971. Oh, that we went up there for the, the uh, Kanakin blast. Kanakin, I believe it was, the last above ground atomic blast that the United States had. We went up there to patrol the waters to make sure. That's what people say that <laughs> it's wrong with me, that we got all this radiation. <laughs> but yeah, we patrolled the waters for a couple of months up there for that, that blast. It was in, uh, yeah, I believe they called it. Uh, it might have been Saspo, but I, I don't know why I can't. We just thought we were there to make sure nobody else got near that place when they blew it up. Beginning of 1972, we made our second trip to Vietnam, at which point we were patrolling the waters and uh, dropping off Marines. And then going back, we were taking more of rounds and 50 caliber rounds. So we were shelling. You can see the beach, and I've never seen more beautiful beaches in my life. <laughs> Other than the bullet holes, the beaches were beautiful. Um, you, I was told you could go into town during the day and not worry about where you were going. But like I said, 
I never, I knew a lot of my friends when I came back from Vietnam had been to Vietnam. And, well, of the six, five are dead now uh, from either PTSD or substance abuse. Originally, I, I liked, uh, you know, once you get to know everybody, it, it's, it's a family. All these guys are family to me. Anything that they, anybody that needed anything, that's the thing about the military and tin cans especially because we're such a small group that you better have my back because I always have yours. That's, you know, if you needed something, and I, I'm probably worse at that today than I ever was because now if this one of these guys called me from anywhere in the United States, I'd be there to help him. That's the way military tin can families, I can't say for other ships, but tin can families are like that. The brothers. Okay, I would normally get up every morning and breakfast and then depending, um, like I said, I was a hot shellman, so depending on where we were on the gun line, I'd either be going up and working on the torpedo deck, which, you know, everything is chipping and painting and it just made ship maintenance and um, and then, other than that, I was in the gun mount. So, it was pretty much uh, eight to ten hours a day in the gun mount, and then the rest, yeah. Because you do three to four hour shifts. And then, especially if we were online. Then again, you know, we, I think we spent a couple weeks trailing uh, one of the aircraft carriers, but that was a minimal duty that we did. We were more involved in direct contact and uh, yeah like I said our second trip over there we're um, very close to shore very close to shore that's why I caught a piece of shrapnel in my arm and uh, they said don't worry about it because I was bringing I had to bring the helmets up to the bridge because we were taking like a 50 caliber rounds and mortar rounds which put us about 250 or 300 yards offshore I believe and uh, so they pulled the strap around and said, don't worry about it. <laughs> and then once when we were over in Vietnam, they, we fired a practice round that I went in the water and had to recover. You bring it back on board and ship it out. You sent sh ship out all the uh, information that was gathered on the, uh, well, I guess it was a computer at that time. Everybody was very, very fair, or very good to every. like I said, when you're brothers, when you're family like that, everyone treats everyone. As long as you do your job and respect everyone else, then you get that respect back. There wasn't one officer or chief petty officer that I didn't like or that I, in our division, you're more in with uh, your first class. I mean, you have a, a gentleman that's in charge of your division, the chief is in charge of the division. But a lot of the, all your work is done with your first class is the guy that gives you all the orders. You know, he gets chain of command. That's how it works. We hit a, a well, uh, I call it a tsunami because I lived over there, but uh, we were doing, uh, I think they said 31 degree rolls. We were like this. They said another two or three degrees and we'd have flipped. Yeah. High winds and heavy, stand by for high winds and heavy seas. <laughs> yeah, but making sure everything else wasn't going everywhere. <laughs> well, the racks were so close together, you weren't going, because they were, they were just canvas. So you're not going anywhere once you're in there. <laughs> it just lays right down inside. So we went to, um, we stopped in Hong Kong on the way back from uh, Yakuska after we put the gun mount on. And then, uh, the, then after that, our only, uh, other time, and I'm not sure which time it was, the first or second trip over was uh, Bangkok, Thailand. It was the only other place that we went. Uh, in May of uh, 1972, uh, we were on the gun line and I got high-lined onto an oiler to be sent home about four days prior to my original discharge date. I was a TMT-3, and one day when I was coming back, I didn't have my white hat on. And I got busted, and 
I spent three hours in the brig, and when I got back to the ship, the XO uh, took a rank away from me for not wearing the white hat. So he knocked me down, to, and as I was scheduled to go up for enlistment, because we were, we were getting ready to go back over to Vietnam, and they said, if you're going to re-up, then you should re-up over there, because everything is tax-free. So I had seriously considered staying in until that happened. And then um, there were a couple situations, that, and this doesn't go any, well, it does. The gentleman that was in charge, my, my direct boss was um, Afro-American. I don't know if that's the proper way to put it. But he could not pass the E5, E6 exam, so they would not let me take the E5 exam. So that's a, little, a couple of the things that deterred me. My father-in-law, like I said, had been career military. He was um, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam as, as a medic. So you know, he encouraged me to stay in to say that you know that's what our government needs is people that are willing to give their life in more than one way to the country. What I, what I did. I loved. I really I enjoyed working with the, the, the crew that I worked with. And I wouldn't, as far as I know, I wouldn't want it any different. Other than the trauma in Vietnam, which I kept buried for a number of years, um, only because I felt that there were um, more people that were hurt far worse than I was. But it, it was with me for the past 52 years. So there's nothing that, nothing that I would have done different other than perhaps staying in the military. That would be the only thing different.